Okay. Um, this is our first of uh, hopefully many uh, complete sports care Q and A's. Uh, the first one we're doing here with uh, with Ellie Pashley, um, excellent uh, runner, uh, marathon runner, ten k and, and half marathon distance runner. Yeah. So welcome, Ellie. Thanks for, for coming on board. Oh, no worries, Dave. Happy to talk about running anytime. Just to go through sort of a list of some of your uh, achievements over the last little while. So uh, some of your times, a 226 marathon, a a 31.10k. And obviously looking to be uh, an Olympic um, runner, hopefully in the uh, the Olympics that are happening this year. So just quickly, how how has the the pandemic affected uh, sort of a lot of your training and your preparation for, for, for those events? Yeah, well, the, the main thing that it's affected is, has been our racing opportunities this year. So almost every single race got cancelled from March onwards. Um, we've been pretty lucky that training hasn't been affected being runners, but we've still been able to run and, and do most things. It's been more that we weren't able to train with our group and weren't able to go to the gym and things like that throughout the year. So yep. that's sort of been the main the main way that my training's been affected, but yeah it's more the the racing side of things that's suffered which has been the case for everybody and um more recently you've um well i suppose you're still doing a little bit of physio work but uh you've you've moved into the online coaching realm a little bit as well and um so uh, um, co-director of run strong online coaching um, can you talk a bit about uh, Run Strong and, and what your role is and what you offer there? Yeah, sure. So uh, Run Strong, it was started by my coach, Julian Spence, who he's also a, a marathon runner uh, based down at the Surf Coast and the owner of the running company, which is a store in Ballarat. And so he basically just started coaching a few of us in Geelong. We, we were just friends and we used to run together and he inadvertently became our coach, probably because he thought more about (laughs) coaching philosophy than the rest of us and um, we sort of developed a little group down there and then it just expanded to the point where he had people asking him for coaching and uh, didn't really have the capacity to take more on so he asked if I'd be interested in getting into coaching and I was a little unsure at the start but um, yeah I, I took on a couple of athletes and I actually loved it straight away it's it's got a lot of similarity to physio as far as load management and things like that goes. Um, So yeah, we, we then just built it from there and made it a proper, a proper company. And now we've got around 20 coaches who work with us. Essentially um, we just write monthly training programs for people and everything's completely individualized. So we've got runners from beginners to high level athletes and yeah, we just, we, do new programs for them each month and this year's been a bit of a funny one without having having races to to work towards but we've been really impressed by all the people that we coach and how motivated they've been and you know doing solo time trials and and still really keen to improve and yeah so that's that's basically what run strong is yeah that's great and it sounds like it's really sort of going from strength to strength at the moment as well Uh, a lot of coaches on board and definitely a lot of participants that's fantastic All right. So the um, the reason I got you on today is I wanted to I wanted to chat a little bit about um, sort of building a running program and um, and some of the things that you guys might consider. But I suppose both per- personally, but also professionally, as a as a running coach and a physio as well. Um, so uh, so let's I suppose I'll develop a little bit of a hypothetical uh, hypothetical person for you. So. Someone who's maybe 30 year old, uh, female, uh, aiming to do their first marathon. Um, what sort of information would you get from this particular person at baseline? And, and um, what do you sort of find helps you structure a, a plan for someone like that? Yeah, so when, when people first inquire, we, we get a lot of information from them. So we want to know everything about their running history you know they might be completely new to running but if if they've run before we want to know how long they've been running for how much running roughly they do each week their longest ever run if they have a group that they train with or if it's all solo 
um, just to get a really clear picture of what they've been doing, which these days it's pretty handy with apps like Garmin Connect and Strava. You can, you can actually look at it on those um, platforms also. And then we want to find out a lot about uh, injury history, medical history, mm. lifestyle, family, work. So um, people's work has a really big impact on, I guess, their ability to, to tolerate load. So if they're a tradesman who's on their feet working, you know, lifting and working hard all day, that's going to affect sort of how much running they might be able to tolerate. Mm. And desk jobs if people have got a family you know they might have six kids or <laughs> they're just getting a really good picture of of their lifestyle and and other commitments and interests that they have um and even just trying to find out which days might work best for them for say a longer run or or to go to a track and do some intervals or something like that so we use a questionnaire in the in the early stages to get to get a good idea of this um and then yeah that that's sort of the starting point. Yeah, yeah, no, very good. And um, I suppose, yeah, how do you, uh, you know, how would you sort of, um, let's say with our 30, uh, 30 year old female aiming to do her first marathon, let's say no kids, um, you know, available to, to do some running after work and on weekends. Um, sort of how would you go about sort of structuring a, um, a, a plan? let's say you know um you know the types of runs that you might sort of be suggesting on uh, on given parts of the week and um you know how often you might sort of be encouraging them to run what would you sort of consider um with, with someone like that yeah so with uh with that case i guess you'd want to know she hasn't done a marathon before but has she done a 5k or a 10k or a half marathon um what times has she done that in if she has that that's really helpful in in developing paces for mm -hmm. the program and then, again, if she's done any sort of workouts or sessions before, so if she's used to just running easy pace every day or if she's done some speed work or some tempo work before, um, then that can be really helpful to know as to when we start to add that into her program. Uh, her longest long run. Mm -hmm. And depending on how far out she is from the marathon, we don't, we don't really need to ramp things up too much in the long run department until you get sort of three months out or so but that gives you a really good idea of what she could tolerate for a long run at the moment mm. so then we might we might have a look at her weekly structure and if sunday is a good day for a long run which tends to be the most common thing for runners um, we might set her longest run of the week on sunday so we're going to start roughly with where she's been and then if she's done a bit of speed work or tempo work in the past um, then we might add that in somewhere in the middle of the week so yeah, we'd start with just one session a week and, and that could be a mix of intervals, um, tempo work, which is like steady paced running for an extended period of time. And then around that between her workout and her long run, that's where we then add in easy runs. So that's very dependent as well on what she's been doing and how many days per week she's been running. So we're not going to jump her up from three days a week to six days a week. It would be yeah a gradual build from there. And yep. we always give people uh, pace ranges for their easy runs as well, because probably <laughs> eight out of 10 people that come to us for coaching run their easy runs way too fast. And they just run the same pace every day as hard as they can. So that's a really important thing, particularly as you're going to increase intensity with workouts and um, increase that load with long runs. They need to be keeping their days in between very, very easy. Yeah, I would find exactly the same. In fact, I'm probably, I have been guilty of it myself as well. <laughs> I've seen some fast runs on your Strava actually. <laughs>And in terms of, so let's say, building a program from uh, from there or building a volume um, from there. So I'm sure a lot of runners will be, you know, probably very familiar with the, the generic 10%, you know, 10 percent a week rule. Um, but what do you go on with a build and, and sort of how would you vary um, uh, or, or build someone's running sort of um, from their base? Yeah, I think... Um... The 10% a week rule can can be good for some people, but again, it really depends on their running history. So somebody who has quite an extensive running history and they've just had, you know, six months off or something because they've been busy or whatever, 
um, they might actually have the capacity to build a little more quickly. So it, it's very dependent on, on the person. If it's somebody that's new to running, then I would, I'd certainly follow that rule roughly somewhere between 10 and 20% per week. And uh, the big thing that we will try and focus on is just changing one variable at a time. So if we're going to add an extra day of running, then that's the only thing we might do for a few weeks. Mm. If we're going to add some intensity or a workout to the week, then we're not going to increase their weekly mileage at all. Um, or if we're really trying to ramp up their long runs, then we're going to keep the rest of the week fairly, fairly similar. So the main thing is, I think, just changing one variable at a time. And yeah, even um, just getting feedback from the, the athlete as well and finding out because they might, um, they might cope quite well with, with a slightly bigger increase uh, in load, but other people you might need to even go more conservatively than the 10% per week rule. Yeah. One other really uh, important thing, I guess, that we do with our programming as well is uh, incorporate absorption weeks. So we'll never be building somebody consistently without dropping them down. And that could vary anywhere between every second week being an absorption week to once every month or so. So yeah, most, most people will go sort of build for two or three weeks and then have a week where you might drop the mileage right off or, or just, just have them doing easy running as opposed to doing uh, too much intensity or yeah, depending on the person, but we always throw them in very regularly. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, it's a, yeah, definitely an important part. And um, you, you sort of touched on sort of run variation through the week, um, you know, talking about your long versus your, your slow and, um, and also sort of your workout style sessions. Um, just, I suppose, from an interest point of view, from maybe some of the listeners, uh, what, what does that look like for you and your program at the moment? So how would you structure your um, weekly running um, and just with your training? Yeah, so uh, my running week is I'll do two workouts. So I'll do one on a Tuesday, which is usually a faster workout. So I might do speed intervals or VO2 max style work. So one kilometre reps or 800 reps or something like that, or a combination Mm -hmm. of longer and shorter intervals. Um, Friday, I do a threshold or tempo run. So that might be, yeah, longer intervals at, at my lactate threshold heart rate. So I use a heart rate strap for that one, or it might be a long tempo. So 10 K or so running below my threshold at, at an aerobic pace, but still quite a bit faster than I do my easy runs. Mm. And then I do a long run on Sunday. So I have recovery days between those three. They're sort of the three key runs of the week, I guess. And yeah, so I run every day, some Mm. days, twice a day. Um, (laughs) And I'm, I'm running around 130 Ks a week at the moment. So I'm just trying to build, build back up and, and get a bit fitter in case some races start happening soon. Yeah, as you say, building back up. Amazing to think that you've actually got some more time in your, in your day or your week to fit any more in on top of that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm pretty slack. I don't work that much these days. <laughs> All right, big one, strength training. How important is it? Yeah, well, I think strength training is very important. I come from a background of being very, very slack with that side of things uh, until I actually got injured and realised how important it was. But I think, um, I mean, ultimately, as runners, we want we want to use strength to allow us to run more or to run consistently without injury and things like that. So the number one priority for most runners is always going to be running. But you need to try and find a way to fit fit strength work in to allow your body to handle the amount of running that you're doing. And, and I think um, it's important to do, yeah, at least one to two strength sessions per week. How you fit that in, it, it's tricky with people with a busy, busy lifestyle. But generally, um, we would encourage people to try and do strength either, either on the night of their higher intensity days so that then their recovery days in between are true recovery days uh, or the day after a, a high intensity workout. So we, we don't really want people doing them before they're going to do one of their, their harder runs because a lot, of, a lot of those higher intensity workouts too are, are slightly strength-based sessions anyway. So if you're doing hill reps or, or speed work, you're actually um, 
yeah, working, working those systems as well, just in a different way. But yeah, I think, um, I think for every runner for longevity in the sport, then it is good to incorporate some form yeah. of strength. Absolutely. Yeah. I, um, I would agree. I, um, it's probably, unfortunately, it's my least favorite part of, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's every runner's least favorite part. I think <laughs> I, I definitely, um, uh, do it a lot more. I'm probably the same as you, um, you know, thought, you know, I might've been a bit invincible there at one point and of course you end up with an inevitable injury and, um, yeah, now more than ever, I, uh, I stick to it. So, um, yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's definitely a big part of, of definitely found, um, obviously, uh, professionally, but also understand it a bit more personally as well now. Yeah, um, definitely. What sort of things do you do and, and in terms of strength training and and, um, and how often do you, uh, do you do them? Yeah, so I've got a, a, drink, a gym program that a strength and conditioning coach wrote me. So I do that twice a week and I tend to, I try to do it on Tuesdays and Fridays after I've done my workouts but sometimes it gets pushed to Wednesday Saturday but it's basically a mix of at the moment I'm trying to do some heavier lifting exercises like squats deadlifts just all the usual I do I'm doing a lot of calf work because I've had a an injury to my perineal tendon and and my foot so I'm really trying to do some heavy weighted calf raises and things like that to keep that uh manageable um and then uh, there's a little bit of core work involved um but yeah it's basically just as much heavy leg work as I can handle my strength and conditioning coach is really good he's fairly aware of the amount of mileage that I'm doing and and how much fatigue I'll carry from those big workouts so he doesn't give me anything too crazy but mm. yeah just a mix yeah no it's good yeah so you and would... I have to tick it off in an app which is really good because it actually makes me do it whereas <laughs> If he didn't know whether I was doing it or not, I don't know that I'd be so dedicated. Uh, it'd, be, it'd be great if he could bar you from your next run if you didn't. If you didn't <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that'd work. <laughs> um, no, that's good. Um, so you you'd advocate from for going quite heavy with a lot of your with a lot of your strength work. You seem to go pretty heavy with some of the stuff you're doing there. Yeah, I think so. I mean, for me, I'm a very um, I'm not a power based athlete at all. I'm very slow twitch endurance. So that that's probably the area that I feel like I most need to work on. Um, I think again, everybody's a bit different and getting an assessment done because some people are quite naturally strong in all their power muscles and, and they might need to work a little more on stabilizers and, and things like that. So I think getting an assessment is a really good way to go about it. Um, yeah. And I mean, the evidence at the moment is pretty, strongly pointing towards the benefits of the the heavier lifting but that can also come with muscle soreness so it's important to try and time that with particularly when you're starting out a down a down period where you don't have a race you know within a week or two because it might take your body six weeks or so to adapt to the heavier strength work and and you'll be pulling up sore so you obviously don't want to go and run a marathon Mm. in the middle of that People with an injury or people with any pain, um, uh, one, do you, do you sort of see them as, um, you know, some of your running um, uh, participants and what would your advice be so to, to people that might be running with an injury or running with pain? Yeah, so, I mean, the first thing that I tell people to do when they tell me they've got some soreness or anything like that is to go and go and see a physio. Um just because, yeah, if, if you get onto niggles early, it can stop them from turning into something major. And, and for me, because our coaching is mostly online, I can get information from people about where their soreness is and what's, what's making it um, feel worse and things like that. But, it, you know, it's, a, it's difficult to sometimes work out exactly what's going on. And that's, it's much better to go and see somebody in person, I think, when that's the case. Um, if they let you know in the early stages, which sometimes people will let it go on for a little bit before they do, but then we can make program modifications straight away. So I'll jump onto their program and depending on what's going on, you know, if they've got a sore calf and the next day they were scheduled in to be doing hill reps or something like that, then I can, I can just completely change that. And it may be that they need to have a few days off until they see the physio or that you might just be able to reduce their load. So if it doesn't seem like it's anything too serious, um, it might just be a matter of modifying the runs that they're doing to really cut 
cut down on load, whether that be taking away any intensity or reducing mileage or, yeah, giving them a few days off. It sort of depends on what's going on. But, yeah, I think it's always good to get them to go and see a physio. And then I'll often um, encourage if the physio has got time to, to shoot me an email or something, just if they've got any specific instructions on on what they think is going on or what they'd like modified in the program, then we can always do that. Yeah. And telling the athlete to, to show the program to the physio as well, because sometimes, I mean, a lot of coaches are, are quite good at, at managing load overall and they know um, the athlete well and what they can tolerate, but the specifics of certain injuries, like it might be that they were doing a, a fart leg where they were changing pace every 15 seconds or something. And if they've got an angry hamstring tendon or something like that, then the physio might be able to go, oh, well, that's probably what stirred that up. So yeah, just communicating between all three parties is the best way to go about it, I think. Um, last one. So I've got, um, I, uh, uh, I've got one listener question. Um, so this is, um, sure. Uh, she follows your career a little bit early so she was um she was interested in actually asking um you know because obviously you know you've gone from being a recreational runner up until um to a uh to an elite uh, elite level athlete now and you know the, the volume of the, of the of the training that you're doing um is now significantly more you're doing it quite quite a lot and, you know your whole week's sort of built around it um is it still enjoyable for you yeah definitely um i think i probably enjoy it more than ever now to be honest i think I still have days like everybody does where running's a drag and I wake up and I can't be bothered to go for a run or, you know, I get nervous before every track session I do and have that feeling of dread all day when I've got something like that on in the afternoon. But um, 90% of the time, yeah, I, I still really enjoy it. And I think the best thing about running these days too is it there's so many opportunities to go and travel and race overseas and, you know, experience some of those marathons in different cities of the world, which is pretty cool. And um, the whole running population has the opportunity to, to do that, which is different to a lot of other sports. So yeah, I still love it. And I know when I'm forced to have a couple of days off, I, at the start, I don't mind it. And then by a day two, I'm pretty uh, antsy to go for a run. So yeah, brilliant. Yeah, it's good. That's good. Well, thank you very much for your time, Ali. Very informative. And um, yeah, uh, all the best with your preparations for, uh, for next year. I'm sure you've got a lot on your hands. And um, have a great Christmas as well. Yeah, thanks, Dave. You too.